Hi, I'm James Catherall, founder of Catherall Audio, and today I'm bringing you five tips from a DCI audio engineer to help bring your audio to the next level for your programs. One of the most unique parts of the marching arts activity is the time limit we have to get all of our equipment set up and ready to go for our performances. This difficulty often gets overlooked because we've been doing it for so long that it's just part of what we do. But every time I talk to audio professionals outside of this world, it's one of the big things that shocks them. We have about two to three minutes to get all of our equipment set up, plugged in, sound checked, and ready to go. They'll tell me, I usually have 30 minutes to an hour or even more to get all of that done. And I say, yep, and we have two to three minutes. It's no small feat to pull off. It takes a large amount of planning and practice to make it work. Now, when creating the procedure for your ensemble, the first thing you should do is list out all of the things that need to get done during your setup. Then assign these jobs to different members of the ensemble. Most often it's the front ensemble members and the staff helping get most of it done. But this can also include other members like your battery, winds, and if you're a high school program, it can include parents as well. Anyone that is involved in your setup should have a clear job that's laid out for them, whether it includes any audio setup or not. No one should be pushing into the performance without knowing exactly what to do to get the ensemble ready to play. Make sure these jobs are realistic as well. It can be easy to load the synth players or the more experienced members with a lot of jobs, but you also have to factor in the actual amount of time it takes to walk around and get everything pushed into place and plugged in. Overloading one person with too many setup responsibilities can create a major bottleneck in your setup procedure. So that's step number one. After all the jobs are clearly defined, the next step is a big one. Practice the setup. It can be hard to justify spending time on your setup process because we always want to be working on our actual production, cleaning it, teaching skills, and getting reps. But remember, the setup is part of your performance. Even though it's not judged, it still plays a big role in how well your actual judged performance goes. A stressful and unorganized setup can be the quickest thing to ruin what could have been a great performance. Instead of your performers feeling confident, it can put them in a stressed and overwhelmed state of mind before they even played a single note. It's well worth it to take a large chunk of rehearsal time to go over the setup responsibilities and do multiple practice run-throughs of it. This shouldn't be a one-time thing either. Something that I like to incorporate throughout the season is including a full push-on setup as part of the full run at the end of rehearsal. As an audio person in the activity, the most stressful part of my job by far is the setup before the performance. Because it can take all the hard work all season long and throw it out the window because something went wrong during setup. This is a common saying in the activity and in the audio world in general. It can be tempting to think, man, if we just had these really nice speakers or microphones or mixer or whatever, we would instantly sound so much better. But that rabbit hole is never ending. There are endless things that any ensemble could upgrade and that keeps growing as newer gear is released from companies. But a highly trained ear can do a lot more for your sound than a fancy set of speakers could. I would trust a highly experienced audio engineer to make better sounds with an analog Yamaha mixer than I would a novice with a high-end Digico mixer, because they have the training and ear to make the most out of the equipment they have. Now, how do you develop your ear? By actively listening to how good ensembles are creating their sound. Pick ensembles that you really enjoy listening to and see how they've set up their mix. Listen to how their mallets sit in the sound and how loud they have their subs throughout the show and any other things that stand out as high quality sounds. This doesn't necessarily need to come from within the marching arts either. When you go to a concert, a musical theater performance, or any type of live music venue, try to listen actively and dissect their mix and how they're producing it. Over time, this will improve your ear to help you make your own ensemble sound better. And just like any other type of skill, it takes practice to develop it. Now, to go along with the previous tip, once you've developed your ear, you need a strong knowledge of your equipment to be able to apply your vision. All of that training won't help when you don't know what knobs to move or what button to press to make the adjustments you want. I received a great piece of advice when I was young and just starting out on the audio side. Every time you get a new piece of gear or have a piece of gear that you don't know how to use, 
take it home, sit down with the manual and go through it page by page. Press all the buttons and figure out exactly how it works. One of the best things I did when I started out was to take home a new digital Yamaha mixer that my ensemble just purchased and read through the full 100 plus page manual and physically found each menu, pressed all the buttons that it described. For my personal learning style, this really helped to strongly ingrain it into my memory. It's not super common in our lives to sit down with a manual every time we buy something new because often consumer electronics are intuitive to use. You don't need to read a manual to know how to turn on your TV or how to make your microwave work. But keep in mind, a lot of audio gear isn't developed for a mass consumer audience. It's often designed with an audio engineer in mind. Now this can have a bit of a learning curve to start out if you've never delved into the audio world. But as you learn more, you'll find that a lot of gear works very similarly and it's often just differences in how to navigate different menus or where buttons are placed. Reading through manuals and learning about your equipment does take a solid upfront investment, but it's well worth it when you're in a rehearsal and can make really quick adjustments without slowing down everyone's flow. And you'll feel like a magician as you quickly press all the buttons and get to the exact menu you need to tweak the sound as everyone around you stares in awe. Asking questions can be immensely helpful when you're running into audio problems. It can be scary to reach out to other people for fear that you'll be bothering them or wasting their time. But having a good mentor or even just sending out a cold call to someone that you know has a lot of experience can go a long way towards helping you solve audio issues. There are a lot of smart audio minds in the marching arts activity, and more likely than not, they've gone through the same or similar struggles that you're dealing with right now. I think one of the things that makes this activity great is our willingness to help share our tribal knowledge and lift each other up for the betterment of the activity as a whole. Rather than to try to struggle through any problems you're facing, you can send a quick message to someone that has been through all of that already, and they can help assist you to solve the problem. And really, what's the worst that can happen? You might get ghosted or they'll say, hey, sorry, I'd love to help you out, but I'm just too busy to get involved. And at that point, you can reach out and ask somebody else. I've been lucky in my career to have great mentors that were able and willing to answer a quick text or hop on the phone to walk me through whatever I was dealing with at the moment. And that was huge for me. And now I'm doing my best to pay it forward and help anyone else that's trying to navigate the audio world like I was. Now for the last tip. At this point of the video, you may be thinking, all of this sounds great, James, but I'm a band director or a front ensemble manager and I'm already overwhelmed with all of my other responsibilities and I don't have the time to figure out all of the things you just talked about. And that's totally okay. At that point, you should be picking up the phone and trying to call someone that can be your full-time audio manager and help you take care of all of the things I just talked about. Gone are the days of expecting a front ensemble person to manage all of the audio responsibilities in this activity. Audio has been one of the fastest expanding parts of what we do. It's unreasonable to expect the front ensemble team to clean a 16th note mallet run and also worry about why channel seven on the mixer isn't working. The responsibilities have grown too much and it'll just result in both of those things suffering. Historically, it fell on the front ensemble's shoulders to figure it all out because the majority of the audio gear lives in the front ensemble. But we need to separate those roles out to be able to benefit the ensemble the most. I know this isn't feasible for all groups across the country or world even, but the importance of a dedicated audio staffer can't be understated. Not everyone has the luxury in their budget to be able to afford a full-time audio staff, but I would hope that we can all raise that role as a priority in our ensembles. Even if this person isn't at every rehearsal, it can still be a major benefit to have someone coming by somewhat regularly to set up procedures and dial everything in so that it can work when they're not around. This will go a long way towards making your front ensemble staff's life easier and more manageable and help your auto equipment function more reliably and sound better. That's it for this video. If it was helpful, it would mean a lot to me if you could give it a like and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one.